of WSN, I'm going to give a, an intertidal natural history talk today, but I'm going to be talking about this emerging issue of uh, microplastics in sandy beach ecosystems. So we know that our iconic sandy beaches in Southern California are really important uh, to our culture, and they're an important economic driver, they contribute about $17 billion economically every year, and we have, south of Point Conception, a good proportion of our habitats a sandy beach is so about 80% of that 300 mile coastline um, in the Southern California by the sandy beaches. Um, and they have all these great socioeconomic benefits. They give us coastal protection, uh, lots of recreational uses. Uh, this is a, an example from a Memorial Day weekend in um, uh, Los Angeles County. And many different activities, many different uses, at least some of which are related to biological diversity. So we have ecosystem services, uh, like viewing shorebirds, viewing marine life, surf fishing, those kind of things. Um, and they're also important habitat for threatened species like snowy plovers, uh, important spawning grounds for uh, cool things like uh, California grunion that are fishes that nest on beaches. Um, but there is a, a whole host of threats. I'm not going to try and focus on more than one today, so we're going to talk just a little bit about marine debris in these systems. And so there's all kinds, I'm sure you know, have heard about things like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and the pollution in our oceans and the prevalence of pollutants, particularly plastics, um, in our marine systems and coastal systems. And so we have a lot of uh, potential risks to wildlife uh, from things like entanglement, uh, ingestion of plastics. We see a lot of seabirds that are ingesting plastics and that can uh, cause problems blocking up the GI tract. Uh, and in a, a sort of an added problem with, my, uh, with marine debris is this uh, propensity that they have to attract, to absorb uh, persistent organic pollutants, so things like PET, PCBs, these hazardous man-made organic chemicals that are very persistent in the environment and they tend to accumulate around uh, marine debris. Uh, so there's economic costs to marine debris. If you have to collect and remove them, we could certainly uh, talk about that economic cost. There can be costs to coastal fisheries, uh, the prevalence of marine debris like here in uh, the Bologna wetlands in LA uh, can impact property values. And there have been some studies that have looked at how they um, economically can influence visitation. So a study in uh, Orange County that was done looked at the choices that people make about the beaches that they visit and beaches with high amounts of debris can cause you to drive further to go somewhere that's a nicer beach with less trash, essentially. And so in terms of economic cost, they calculated that for Orange County, they could save about $148 million in a year if they removed 100% of their marine debris, and that's like $65 per resident, so a substantial uh, impact on people's choices about where they go to beaches. And so there's different categories of marine debris, no, these are NOAA classifications. I'm really gonna focus on uh, what I'm going to call marine debris, which is a sort of macro debris, large things that if you're walking on them, you should be able to visibly see them and pick them up. And then the other category is micro debris, so things that are less than five millimeters, um, down to sort of microscopic sizes. And we see these types of debris, marine debris and, and, and micro debris, uh, in, in all different zones. So we see them floating in the water column. Um, incidentally, only about half of the types of plastic float. So we may actually be doing some underestimation uh, in these types of systems. Uh, we see it on the benthos, same thing, uh, down into, into benthic environments, um, and, and we see it washing onto our sandy beaches and, and shore environments. And so my goals with this study, this is part of a larger study, but I wanted to look uh, just specifically at, at uh, marine debris and, and micro debris, see if we can characterize the types of debris that we're seeing, and uh, look at the distribution 
of these types of debris on Southern California beaches. And one of the things I wanted to test was just from a quick 15 minute stroll on the beach, you know, if you go for a 15 minute stroll, can you predict the prevalence of micro debris by the presence of macro debris, basically? Can we count the big stuff? Does that tell us about the, the, about the small stuff on beaches? Um, and then finally, to look at the ecological effects of this pollutant in our environment to see if micro debris is entering uh, the, the food webs. So for our marine debris surveys, uh, this was done uh, this summer, May, June, 2015. We looked at 24 beaches from Santa Barbara, Ventura, Los Angeles County, and the Channel Islands. Uh, we just walked 50, 50 meter, two meter, but 50 by two meter band transects uh, at the strand line and in the swash zone, and basically counted all anthropogenic marine debris. Uh, and that was done uh, at, at 24 beaches. Um, and not surprisingly, this is probably fairly obvious, but just to break it down, uh, the marine debris surveys by item, we see uh, a lot of uh, food-related plastics, right? So styrofoam, uh, single-use food-related items, uh, broken down bits of, of other hard plastics, uh, a little bit of miscellaneous non-plastics, things like cardboard and aluminum cans, aluminum, aluminum cans, um, <laughs> and, uh, and some fishing-related uh, gear, and a lot of this uh, accumulation of fishing gear is actually from the Channel Islands. So we... Um, of the marine debris, of the anthropogenic marine debris that we're seeing, about 84% of it is, is, is plastic debris. And just, you know, a, one of the takeaway messages, an awful lot of this, at least on Southern California beaches, are single-use food-related plastics. And we'll come back to that um, at the end. So if we look at the breakdown uh, in terms of the distribution across these 24 beaches of plastic and non-plastic debris, um, I've arranged these beaches from north, Gaviotas are furthest north, to Duckweiler in LA County in the south, and then we have the Channel Islands that are separated by this uh, little dotted line. I should point out that this is a log scale. Um, and you can see that, you know, there's, there's maybe a little bit of spatial patterning in the data. There are definitely some beaches that don't have a lot of debris. Um, uh, some of the island beaches don't have a lot of debris, but uh, if you change the aspect, basically the, where the sort of catchment is, uh, you can you get a, a lot of accumulation of marine debris, and this, this actually is a lot of fishing gear, a lot of lobster traps and uh, ropes and buoys and things. Um, so there's a little bit of structure here. You can see that Los Angeles County tends to have a little bit more um, macro debris, um, uh, whereas Santa Barbara and Ventura counties are um, a little bit lower. But part of the takeaway from this graph is that most of the debris that we're seeing is plastic debris. Okay, and so to look, so that was the macro debris, I wanted to look at the microplastics. Uh, this started out just as a sort of voyage of discovery to see what is the prevalence of microplastics, of micro debris in our Southern California beaches. And we do this, this method is uh, just collecting 100 milliliters of, of sand from the slush <coughs> zone and from the strand line. And then we shake up those samples with about 400 milliliters of hypersaline solution. That's to try and float the plastics out, basically. Let that settle, pour off the supernatant, and filter that. And then we're, at this stage, we're just examining the filters and enumerating the types and colors of, uh, of plastics. And so this is a sort of conservative method that we're only counting things that are very obviously, you know, sort of unnatural colors um, that are not natural fibers. Uh, so we're really only enumerating those things that are very obviously um, anthropogenic in origin. Uh, so we're classifying these by color and by type. A lot of what we find are uh, these synthetic fibers. So a, a good proportion of what we're finding is synth synthetic fibers, uh, little bits of polypropylene, probably the, the sort of synthetic fibers that clothing is made out of um, uh, and that marine ropes are made out of, uh, and some small plastic particles. This is slightly larger um, uh, anthropogenic particles. So these are the types of debris that we see in the, uh, on, our, on our beaches. This is, these are sand samples. And if we look at this now, this is 47 beaches across the Southern California Bight, uh, from Avila in San Luis Obispo County, um, down to uh, Crystal Cove in Orange County, and then these are the uh, Channel Island beaches from Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz Islands on the right-hand side here. So you can see again, uh, this is number of items per 200 milliliters of sand. Uh, so you can see this uh, predominantly plastic 
fibers that we're seeing, so synthetic fibers that we're seeing, um, a little bit of particles, uh, maybe a little bit more on the islands, but predominantly we're seeing uh, these, these synthetic fibers in the environment. Uh, it's fairly um, variable in terms of uh, the distribution, but you can see that there's, you know, in some cases as many as 40 particles of microplastics in a 200 millimeter of sand, so a handful of sand, 40 particles of microplastics, so, so quite high densities. Uh, one final thing that probably is sort of the next step to look at here, there is a significant effect of littoral cell on the uh, density of plastics on these beaches, the density of particles on these beaches. Um, uh, so Los Angeles, uh, sorry, the, the Zuma cell and the Santa Monica cell are significantly higher than the Ventura, uh, Santa Barbara cell and the island cell. So, um, we'll be looking in a little bit more detail about the river, uh, river outfalls and, and wastewater treatment um, uh, going forward here. Um, and one final thing, one final point I reminded myself to make about this slide is there isn't a significant relationship between macro debris and micro debris. It's sort of a general non-significant trend, but it's not easy to predict the prevalence of micro debris from the macro debris. Uh, so the next step was to, to look at, is there any mechanism for these microplastics entering into the food chain? Uh, these are microplastics that are in the range of sort of zooplankton sizes. And uh, this includes micro, primary microplastics, which are manufactured to be small. So that's the, the raw plastics, pre-molding. Pre um, and microbeads, so from personal care products, those types of small microbeads. And secondary microplastics, which are the breakdown products of larger um, plastics. And so these are microbeads. Uh, from some of these personal care products. They look an awful lot like grunion eggs, right? So they might be something tasty looking that things want to eat. Um, here's other sort of breakdown products uh, scaled with a couple of little beetles here. Um, and so one of the organisms we wanted to look at is uh, to see if these filter feeding sand crabs uh, would be ingesting these microplastics. Um, these are organisms that vary in the swash zone. They, they uh, filter feed using their antennae here. You can see they're nice and extended. Um, and so the potential for sort of capturing and ingesting those um, microplastic fibers and particles was certainly there. Uh, and indeed, you know, the first place we looked, uh, in the guts of these sand crabs, we were actually seeing uh, a good deal of <coughs> synthetic fibers. And in this case, this is a microbead from a personal care product. Uh, so to expand this a little bit, we looked at 11 beaches across five counties, uh, from San Luis Obispo down to Orange County. Um, uh, and, we, and we sampled 78 crabs to see what the, the um, prevalence of ingested microplastics was. 41% of those crabs had ingested microplastics, um, and an, uh, so at an average of across those 78 crabs, about 1.2 uh, uh, microplastics per crab. So we've identified a mechanism by which microplastics are entering the sandy beach ecosystem food chain. Uh, not only are the microplastics themselves a problem, so they have um, additives to uh, manufactured plastics, things like plasticizers, phthalates, um, antioxidants, flame retardants. They themselves come with their own set of problems. Frequently, they're endocrine disruptors. Uh, they also have, have adsorbed chemicals, so this propensity of chemicals to um, adsorb these persistent organic pollutants uh, up to a million times concentration in the ambient seawater. So critters are definitely eating these. Uh, they're carrying along with them these uh, loads of persistent organic pollutants. Um, and here's a, a little corbina uh, that's been caught with a, a sand crab as bait. Uh, the barred surf perch, these are um, near shore fishes that are potentially eating sand crabs. And then uh, things like willets, wimbles, and sanderlings that are also eating sand crabs. So we've, we've identified a mechanism for uh, the introduction of microplastics into the um, sandy beach ecosystem food chain and potentially into a, a, human, uh, a human food source here. Um, and so this is an, an emerging global issue. We've also been working in the Cook Islands in the South Pacific, relatively remote islands. We've identified both um, macro plastics there. This is a, a trash cleanup that we did with some students here. Um, and we've also identified microplastics in these relatively remote beaches. Uh, so uh, again, this potential for pollutant concentration and um, uh, some other recent studies have identified these in, in fishes and shellfishes that have been sold for consumption. 
And so there's many things we can do to try and address this problem. It's certainly impossible to remediate at the beach, at the source, to remove these particles from the environment. And so we really have to focus on source reduction. There's various um, uh, efforts to reduce uh, the loss of plastics into the environment from manufacturing, uh, a recent microbeat ban uh, that Governor Brown just signed that's gonna go into effect in 2020, uh, certainly reducing single-use uh, packaging, uh, food-related plastic that's, that was the number one um, item on our local beaches, and the use of actually uh, biodegradable alternatives would be helpful. And then recycling programs for, for fisheries-associated debris, things like polypro and mon monofilament would certainly be helpful. And then the final thing, I'm not really sure how we deal with this yet, but this probably one of the major sources of these microplastics is from domestic uh, municipal wastewater. So we might have to look at some sort of microfiltering system uh, to deal with that. Um, and I just want to acknowledge my co-authors. This work was funded by an HSI STEM grant that uh, aims to incorporate and introduce uh, undergraduate students into research. Uh, and a lot of this work has been driven by a very enthusiastic, dedicated cadre of undergraduate students. So uh, thank you very much.